Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is one that is a very recent case, but it is solved and we pretty much know exactly what happened and we pretty much know exactly why. So I wanted to go ahead and cover this case for you all now. I do want to apologize in advance because some of the names involved are very hard for me to pronounce. So if I do say anything wrong, please know that I am trying my absolute best. But with that being said, let's just get into today's case. Zori Sadegi was 33 years old and worked at Premonitory Mortgage Path as a software engineer writing software to help the mortgage companies offer out bank mortgages. One coworker who knew Zori remotely said that Zori had been looking for a new job at the time of her death and was using her friend as a reference. The friend described that Zori was kind, helpful, and well-organized. She got along with everybody that she worked with. She was also attending the University of Washington's graduate program, and she also hosted a podcast where she largely talked about the tech industry, and I believe she spoke to Farsi on the podcast. She also had very progressive politics. She believed in human rights and especially women's rights for women in Iran. She was married to a 35-year-old man named Mohammed Malid Nasiri, who once worked as a software engineer at Google. He had worked there for five years, but at the time of his death, he had been working as the lead software engineer for Amazon, which he started in 2022. He once wrote in his blog that when he was growing up in Iran, he was ranked as the second best singer in Tehran in 2007. He then went on to study at Sharif University of Technology, Mohammed and Zuri became married in 2011 after they moved to the U.S. together. The two lived in an upscale neighborhood in a $1.6 million home in Redmond, Washington, a suburb of Seattle. On one of the podcasts, she talked about, you know, basically how it was to find a job in the tech industry. She was known to help others who spoke Farsi find employment within the field. The podcast was streamed on the Clubhouse app, which allows people to talk to each other in chat rooms. So by late 2021, Zuri had been chatting online with a 38-year-old man named Ramin Kodakaram Razari. He was from Texas and he worked as a truck driver. I believe he did also own his own trucking company. They chatted about the same things that she talked about in her podcast with finding jobs in the tech industry and the two quickly became friends and they chatted and texted back and forth every so often. The next summer in 2022, the two actually met in person. But after that, Ramin grew an obsession with Zore. He began calling and texting her over and over and over again and it eventually reached the point where he would text her over a hundred times per day. Then he started calling and texting Mohammed as well. This lasted over the course of several weeks. Zori tried to just completely cut off contact with him, but that did not work. The stalking and obsessive behavior just continued. So pretty quickly, the couple filed a petition for protection order in January. He was given a verbal warning by the police, but naturally, this did not do anything. So after all the texts and calls continued, she filed an order again. In the order, she expressed her fear for herself and her loved ones over this obsessive behavior. She said that Ramin told her that he previously had a history of domestic abuse with his ex-wife and that he was not afraid to break the law. She described his behavior as having bursts of anger and being completely delusional. He said that the only way he was going to stop contacting her is if he killed himself or he died in some other way. He would mail her items of affection to her house and left her voicemails that threatened his life. He threatened himself saying that he would burn himself and the trees around her house. He demanded that she either delete her Instagram or make it public so that he could see what she was posting. I guess somehow he was also able to download an app onto her husband's phone that recorded her talking and Ramin once sent her an edited version of that recording to her to show her that he could hear her. He went as far as getting her friends' addresses and phone numbers. He showed up in their neighborhood several times as well. He would stay at inns nearby and park down the street from her home. According to the protection order, she wrote, quote, I have had major back surgery and my mobility has been affected and I need care 24-7. 
This makes me fear about my ability to respond to a crisis because he has ignored all other avenues. I have asked him to stop calling me verbally and via text. I have called the police and he has been warned not to call or send gifts to my house. Despite the warning, he continued to call, leaving voicemails more than 10 times a week and sending gifts. He has delivered flowers to my house personally, and on two other occasions, he sent gifts, also leaving a voicemail indicating that he hired a jazz band to play outside of my house for two hours, but he later canceled it. His voice messages to me have been the cause of anxiety and insomnia for me. They include him crying and begging for me to pick up, him threatening to burn himself and the tree in front of my house, also telling me to either delete my Instagram account or make it public so that he could see the content that I post. He has bursts of anger and is completely delusional. These delusions make me fear for my life and the lives of my loved ones. He has also been contacting my husband and continues to do so, sending him more than 20 messages every day. He has been calling my husband constantly. He has also called my friends and acquired their addresses and their phone number without their knowledge or their permission. It should also be noticed that I have at no point shared my or my husband's contact information, address, or other personal identifiable information with him. He has also come to my neighborhood several times staying at inns around the neighborhood and has parked down my street in hopes of seeing me. He has a history of domestic violence involving his ex-wife and he has mentioned of not being afraid to break the laws. All of this has caused me great distress and pain, and now I am suffering from a deep-seated fear for my safety. It has had a toll on my recovery and my ability to rest or step outside of my house without fear and anxiety. I haven't been able to open up the curtains in my bedroom out of fear of him being outside and watching me. He has threatened me implicitly by sharing information about my family and my home country and has implied several times that he has connections of nefarious nature there. His actions has caused a huge strain on my mental and physical well-being and I'm seeking to get this order approved in hopes of opening a way for me to move forward and recover from the current situation. As recently as February 28th, I have received two voicemails from my harasser. The voicemails were at 1.18 a.m. and 1.50 a.m. These messages are vulgar, angry, and threatening, and I just felt unsafe going back to sleep. He immediately messaged my husband about the voicemail on Telegram and has made further demands. He has also spoken to one of my friends asking for personal information, which led me to contacting him immediately. He has also spoken to one of my friends asking for personal information, which led him to contacting me immediately. She then went on to highlight the important dates of all of the times that she told Ramin to leave her alone. This all started on November 6th when she verbally told him to leave her alone. She did the same thing on November 8th. All throughout November, she blocked any number associated with him and blocked him on all social media. But she was continuously getting messages from various accounts and various numbers, so she kept having to block all of these different accounts and numbers as they were messaging her. Near the end of November, there were several times that Zoray got calls from inns located down the street from her house that were Ramin. They continued until early December. December 13th is when Zoray got her surgery, and on December 20th, Muhammad left to go to Australia, probably for a work thing, I'm not exactly sure why, but either way, she was left by herself for a while. She finally called the police on December 20th, and I believe they gave him that warning at that time, but by early January, Ramin sent her some jewelry to her home, and by January 16th, she called the police again, and once again, I just think they gave Ramin a verbal warning. Then on January 9th, Muhammad documented a phone call that he answered. So, at 4.36 p.m. that day, Ramin had called Muhammad and hung up immediately. He then called again at 6 p.m., and once again, Muhammad picked up. From his memory, he recalls the conversation as the following. Ramin, hello, this is Ramin. Muhammad, yes, can I help you? Ramin, sorry, I had to hang up earlier because I had someone come by. Can you please give the phone to Zore? Muhammad, no. Ramin, why not? I just want to talk to her. Muhammad, why do you want to talk to her? Ramin, because I love her. Muhammad, you can call her directly and tell her that, but I'm not going to give her the phone. Ramin, she doesn't pick up. Plus, it's not like I'm trying to start a fight. Muhammad, 
Oh, I'm not angry. I'm just incredulous. Ramin, why? What's so surprising? Muhammad, the fact that you have the nerve to call me and ask me to hand the phone to my wife so that you can tell her you love her is incredible. That you expect me to actually want to do it makes me incredulous. I don't know a culture in the world that that would be considered okay. Ramin, are you telling me that you two are married? Muhammad, that's besides the point. Is it okay to mess up someone's relationship if they haven't married? Ramin, I'm just trying to be a friend. Muhammad, that's not what a simple friend would do. Didn't you say you loved her? Ramin, she doesn't like me. It's me who's in love with her, period. I just want to talk to her. Muhammad, well, this is one-sided. You can't carry on a one-sided relationship and be a nuisance. Ramin, still, I wouldn't be angry at them. Muhammad, really? Ramin, I would ask them to come over so that we could talk over a cup of coffee. Muhammad, well, that's just not me. Is there anything else I can help you with? Ramin, no, thank you. And then the call had ended. After that, Ramin had called Zuri again and left her a voicemail that he had just called a family friend, which her and Muhammad both thought was a lie. They called the police to document this, and then they reached out to the family friend to warn her, and that is when they found out that Ramin actually did call the family friend. They didn't hear from Ramin again after he was warned by the police for about another week. This was until January 22nd when he called Zuri again several times in a row. He called several times from a Nevada phone number as well as from his own cell phone number. By February 22nd, Ramin had sent Zuri 82 text messages on Telegram, even though she had blocked him. So, with all of this very clear evidence of stalking and harassment, a bench warrant was issued for Ramin's arrest on March 2nd, 2023. On that day, he was charged with one count of misdemeanor stalking and two counts of telephone harassment. By March 3rd, a judge granted a temporary protection order against him and set in motion the process for a hearing. However, because he was a trucker and he was constantly moving all over the U.S., police were not able to serve him with the warrant because they were never able to track him down. So, by Friday, March 10th, everything came to the worst possible conclusion. At 1.45 a.m. on that day, officers responded to a call reporting that three people had been shot. Police arrived to the home that Zore and Muhammad shared, and immediately they witnessed Muhammad, who was standing at the front door, collapse onto the ground. He had been shot. Officers pulled him out of the house and began CPR, but unfortunately, he did not survive he was pronounced dead at the scene. When officers entered the home, they discovered a male and female inside, both dead from gunshot wounds. Of course, the female was identified as Zore and the male was identified as Ramin. It turned out that Ramin had driven all the way from Texas to Richmond, thousands of miles. He gained access to the house by climbing through a window and shot both Muhammad and Zuri before turning the gun on himself, shooting himself in the chest. Zuri's mother was actually in the house with them, but she was able to escape and call 911 unharmed. There was also a neighbor who lived right behind the couple who actually heard the attack and said the whole thing was just blood-curdling to hear. Of course, this whole thing was a scene that absolutely shocked and outraged the community. They really didn't think that something could happen in such a safe, nice neighborhood. The police were also frustrated because they knew that this was the worst possible case scenario in a situation like this. In addition to the reports of stalking and harassment in that order of protection, it turned out that Ramin actually did have a wife of his own who he had been married to for seven years and the two had a daughter together. So, Ramin had been married to a woman, and I believe they started divorce proceedings about two years before the deaths, but they were still married at the time. But it was said that the two were pretty much separated and seeing other people, but they really only had each other because they were both from Iran and they didn't have any relatives in the U.S., so the two would still talk on a regular basis and would still share details of their love lives to one another because they basically only had each other to talk to, which is really sad and I do have empathy and sympathy for that. Obviously, I don't have sympathy for what Ramin did, but I'm sure it's very hard to be in a foreign country, no relatives, no one except each other. I'm sure that is very difficult. 
But either way, Ramin's ex-wife, who wished to remain anonymous, she said that in the weeks before this incident, she did notice a shift in Ramin's behaviors. She said that months before this, Ramin told his ex-wife that him and Zore were dating after he met her through that podcast. He told her that the two had met up in person multiple times, but she said that a few weeks later, he told his ex-wife that Zori broke up with him against his wishes. After this, she said his behavior changed. She said that he was really crushed when Zori cut him off and that he would often cry when they spoke because of how upset he was. She said that this was very out of character for him, that he had never really been like this before until after Zori had cut off contact with him. After this is when she said he became obsessed with her, but she never thought that his behaviors could escalate in this way. I also don't know anything about the domestic abuse. I don't know if she confirmed it or denied it or if this was something that he was just telling Zori to scare her. That's sort of what I'm thinking about that, but also at the same time, it could totally be true, but I also don't get why they would stay in contact if he abused her. Again, it could be because they really did only have each other, but I don't know if it's confirmed that he abused his ex-wife at any point or his daughter. I did see in some articles that there was some behavior that Zori was hiding from her husband when her and Ramin first met, so maybe there was something going on for a minute. I'm not one to victim blame or judge, and I definitely don't want to speculate. We truly don't know if they were friends initially because she truly thought that he was interested in the podcast or if there was something more going on and, you know, something happened and she cut him off. I don't know if them meeting up in person was including her husband or not. I don't know if he even knew about that. I don't know if they truly met up more than once or if it really was only that one time. He said that it was more than once. She said that it was just the one time as far as we know. We don't know exactly which one is true, but either way, whether she did have a short situation with him that went against, you know, her husband, obviously that's bad. Obviously, the husband does not deserve that kind of thing. But no matter the situation, she did not deserve for her life to be lost and obviously neither did her husband. There is no way they could have known that meeting this listener would have caused him to having this obsession and even if she did have some sort of relationship with him, there's no way she could have known that this was what was going to develop from it. Part of me wonders if maybe this was a situation where they started talking and she didn't initially disclose that she had a husband and maybe things were progressing and she was like, you know what, I have a husband, things can't go any farther, we cannot have a relationship, so maybe she sort of led him on, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And then after that, he became obsessed with her, either trying to get her husband to get away from her by calling him all the time, either that or just trying to insert himself in their lives. Maybe he was obsessed with the both of them after that point. Who is to really say? We don't know exactly what was going on in Ramin's head. We don't know what the whole relationship was like between the three of them or between Zore and Ramin. But at the end of the day, he was obsessed with her for whatever reason, and this is what happened. I also saw reports from one neighbor who said that Zori's mother would frequently just sit in front of the house, well, inside the house, but would sit in front of the window and would just stare outside. This says to me that they were all really, really worried that this exact situation would happen, and he just happened to catch him off guard, unfortunately. So, that's pretty much the information that I have on this case. Again, it is a very recent case, but I imagine there won't be too much more that's released about this because I feel like it's a pretty cut and dry case. I do want to blame the police for this one at some level, but honestly, if I'm being completely blunt and honest, I think they did what they could. They charged him with stalking and harassment and they put out a warrant for his arrest, but they just didn't find him quick enough, which, yes, they could have put more hours, more manpower into finding him, but really, who, like, who could have known where he was unless they went and, like, tracked his routes through his trucking company? But even if they did that, who's to say that he even followed the routes or even documented it because he had his own trucking company? So, 
Obviously, I wish more could have been done. But if nothing else, let's let this case be an example of why we need to be so, so, so very careful of every single person that we meet online. Let's make sure to keep our personal information to ourselves. Let's make sure we recognize these types of red flag behavior and keep records and keep receipts. So if something does grow to the point that it can be reported, you have every little detail at your disposal so you can show the authorities just how dangerous this person can be. So that when you make that report, when you try to show the authorities what is truly going on, you have the receipts and you can tell them exactly what's happening. This is truly a tragic situation because Zoray literally knew that this was going to happen. I can't even imagine what could have been going through her and her husband's head when all of this was happening. My heart absolutely goes out to the two of them. But that is all of the information that I have on today's case and now I want to know your guys' thoughts. What do you think of this entire situation? Do you think that the police could have done more? What do you think about Ramin and what was going on in his head? Let me know any thoughts that you have in the comments below. With that, if you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I also have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.